Hi everyone, welcome to our week four of Intro to Research Methods. And today we're going to be talking about phenomenological research methods, or PRM, as I've used on our slides. And phenomenological research methods um, are really focused on a thick, rich description, you'll hear me say that several times, of lived experience. The texts that we're going to be using for today and for this week are a few sections of Cresswell's qualitative inquiry and research design using, or rather choosing among five traditions. Um, and again, that's posted on your Canvas site so you can access that material. And also the Wiley Blackwell text, chapter 14 on neurophenomenology. Uh, I've additionally added some URL links to, in one of which is to the Stanford Plato system that gives a background on phenomenology as a philosophical tradition. And I've also uploaded an additional optional text on training the phenomenological researcher, which you may find useful. So the Cresswell text there you see on the left is the old version and in the middle a newer version of that same text, an updated version. And then down to the right here uh, below my image, my picture is the Wiley Blackwell Handbook of Transpersonal Psychology and it's chapter 14 uh, in that text that we're going to be really focusing on. So the phenomenological research method is related to the philosophy of phenomenology and it's really built upon the, that philosophy. There's the web link that I did add uh, to our Canvas site, but you can see it here um, in case you can't access it for some reason or you need it um, and you're not on our Canvas site. Uh, for general philosophical terms and history and articles on philosophy, this is a great resource to use and I would recommend you um, poking around and just taking some time to become familiar with the uh, plato.stanford.edu site and you can search for different philosophical terms like ontology and epistemology and, and get a history on those types of things. Uh, generally, phenomenology is the study of the structure of experience or consciousness. It's uh, basically asking the question, how do we have our lived first-person experience? The philosophers that this is built upon are Husserl, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, and Sartre, and in particular the first three there. And we'll talk a little bit more about those as we talk about the different types of ph uh, phenomenological research methods. Uh, PRM, for short then is the formalization of this process of phenomenology within specific research terms and methods. So it's, it's uh, taking phenomenology, the study of, and really formalizing it as a research process uh, to be used with, um, for our tradition, psychology, um, but it can be used not just in psychology but in other uh, realms as well, anthropology and, and different areas. But um, it's really the formalization of that uh, research, that inquiry process, and um, an attempt, there have been attempts to standardize, um, but the, like all good standardization, there's people who rise up against it and say, no, 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 you can't standardize, you need to let it uh, flow more smoothly, And um, but that's a different conversation. Um, so the PRM is focused on thick, rich description of first-person accounts, and um, there are three basic types that I want to talk about today. Uh, the traditional division that I've always been um, trained in, uh, I guess that would be the way to, to say it, is the classical and hermeneutical. The classical research method, phenomenological research method, comes out of the Husserl and Merleau-Ponty tradition. The hermeneutical or interpretative tradition comes through Heidegger and also um, one of the researchers that have written about this is Clark Moustakis and he actually uh, wrote a text in 1994 specifically on phenomenological research methods uh, so if you're interested in this tradition make sure to look at his um, his writings as well as some of the other more recent writings on PRM and how it's actually functionally been used and um, utilized within different types of research and the third 
research method that I'm going to be talking about under this category is neurophenomenology. And that's actually the chapter in the Wiley Blackwell, uh, Blackwell text that I'm, I'm going to be covering. Um, the folks that really founded this are uh, Laughlin and Varela and, uh, and their predecessors, the, their uh, protégés came, uh, came from them. Lineage, I should say. All right. So classical phenomenological research method, again, comes largely from Husserl and um, that lineage. Uh, Husserl says essentially that we can be aware of our perception of lived experience. Um, he also used the term um, epoche and uh, discussed how one can bracket out one's assumptions and beliefs. An epoche actually means to abstain from belief and um, and really it was focused on beliefs about existence and in the natural world but um, the bracketing process within the the research method classical research method has focused on bracketing the researchers assumptions about a topic of inquiry and setting that aside in order to try and be more objective in their approach to their topic at hand um, so it's it's leaning away from integrating the, the researcher and trying to stay focused on the research participants and their narratives that they're sharing. That's considered often a more objective analysis of first-person experiences. And again, the researcher interviews participants, a few, and focuses on their rich, thick description of an actual experience. And when they report that and they do their analysis, they stay very close to that description. Um, Classical PRM also can be very structured. There are some uh, classical research method writers who go th who talk about a specific set um, series of processes that you take your data through your um, your uh, descriptions and your your transcripts that you have accumulated from your participants. Um, often multiple transcripts from a one participant. Um, so if you have uh, three participants or five participants and you have three three interviews from each one you could have nine to fifteen transcripts um, just on those several individuals but anyway um, you take that those transcripts and you take them through a specific process of analysis and you know, it, can, it can be very structured but the point of that is to really focus in on uh, the description of experience that is held within that uh, those participants uh, just, um, uh, interviews. The second is hermeneutical and a phrase that's been used more recently is interpretative. An interpretive uh, interpretative uh, phenomenological analysis or IPA. But essentially we're really um, talking about the hermeneutical uh, uh, phenomenological research method. And this tradition comes through the Heideggerian lineage. Uh, Heidegger was uh, responding to Husserl and uh, essentially saying that whatever lived experience we have, it's inherently uh, filtered through our own interpretation, our own lenses of being a person that's embedded within culture and within society and with even having a particular language can um, add an interpretive lens when we're either talking about our own subjective experiences or when we're a researcher looking at other people's or hearing other people's experiences. We have these lenses that are, are um, uh, inherently in place and that we cannot remove, uh, is what Heidegger would say. So um, again, focuses on lived experience and it's a, all lived experience is inherently within this world um, and we're surrounded within particular contexts. We can't bracket it out, but we can name our assumptions and we can give our own uh, um, first person experiences with the topic, uh, research topic at hand. And by doing that, we can come to a better understanding of how our own interpretations and our own lenses are potentially influencing what we're hearing from our participants and how we're interpreting our participants' experiences. Now, one way to talk about this is to say, uh, to talk about biases and how our interpretive lens might bias what we're hearing from our participants in a particular slant. Um, say that we're only hearing certain things that we are able to hear because of our lens. 
But another way to talk about this is that because we have first-person uh, lived experience with the topic at hand, we inherently have an interpretive lens that makes it unique for, for us as a researcher to look at the experience uh, in question in a particular way. We, we have first-person experience with it, and then because of that, we're going to be looking for certain things that another person might not be able to look for because they haven't had that experience. Um, an example might be if a person, if you're talking about um, the a first person lived experience of zikr within the Sufi tradition. Now, if no one, if a, if a researcher has not been in uh, engaged in the zikr practice within the Sufi tradition, it's going to be very hard for them to have a lens and have the right set of questions and the understanding of that particular lived experience of someone who has been to zikr and has been engaged in Sufi practice. And so somebody who comes from that tradition is going to have um, a different uh, a different language, a different way of viewing the experience, and, and be able to get at a, um, potentially get at a much uh, a richer description of that experience because they can ask the right questions. And so uh, that's, that's the um, other way of looking at it. Rather than calling it a bias, you can say it's actually really a, a good advantage uh, when you're doing this type of uh, descriptive uh, research. So there are issues of language. Again, like I was saying, um, there's uh, ongoing discussions um, that uh, you know the language that we learn within our culture has a reciprocal effect on our brain and our neurological structures. Different languages affect us in different ways. Some languages are more relational. Some languages focus on objects um, more so than relationship between objects. Um, some languages, like English, are very uh, action-oriented. So there's a, there's a question that, you know, because of our language and how it affects neurological structure, is that affecting our lens through which we uh, see or experience our own first-person lived experiences? So when I have an experience of um, uh, a numinous experience or mystical experience or even just an experience of rain falling on my face when I'm sitting outside and having a sense of peace. Um, when I start to put that into language and I start to describe that to somebody else, those are actually two different layers. One is internal, one is the externalization. Um, is that process that I'm going through an inherently interpretive process? And if so, then are we really communicating the raw um, uh, lived experience? Well, maybe not. We're, 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 we would be communicating the interpreted, the layered um, uh, experience, be just f merely from communicating through language when, when um, being interviewed about that experience. So these are things that you would want to have in mind as you are uh, engaging in phenomenology. There are uh, questions that, that come up and kind of fun discussions. You know, it's very philosophical and really gets to um, what is ontology, um, what is reality, and how are we uh, able to access uh, reality and, and, and research it in a conscious way. The third area is neural phenomenology. And this tradition is uh, newer to me as well as newer in, um, in the research methods world. Um, in the 90s, uh, late 80s and 90s um, is when it's, it started emerging. You have in the uh, chapter neural phenomenology chapter, um, you'll hear about the history of this tradition and how Laughlin in, um, invited Varela to a conference and they um, were sharing their, um, their thoughts and ideas and how out of that emerged this tradition. Uh, it's very interesting to see, see how that came about. Um, it, neurophenomenology is essentially the combination of phenomenology, which is the study of consciousness and first-person lived experiences, and uh, neuropsychology or neuro neurological studies, uh, not just neuropsychology, but neurological studies, and which is essentially the utilization of neurological measures like EEG, 
uh, fMRI and different uh, ways of looking at the structures of the brain and the processes of the brain. As uh, so, what, um, for example, something that might be done within this tradition is have somebody you know think about um, a, a memory that they had as a child while they are in an fMRI, and so the the study could be focused on does that memory or having that memory, recalling that memory. Um, elicit a certain emotional and cognitive state and if and when that state is elicited what's physically going on in the brain itself and then you can start to pair those up so you can see how um, neurophenomenology might be very useful and valuable one of the things that I found very important in this chapter is that the authors say it is best to have participants who are well versed in introspective practices such as ex very experienced meditators, people who are used to creating certain states of consciousness, being able to hold their attention in a certain way so that the uh, neurological tests can be done. Um, now, that doesn't always have to be the case. Not all the participants have to have that level of um, expertise, but it helps if you're looking at particular states of consciousness or uh, uh, intention, attention, and these types of things. Uh, one of the things that was not mentioned in this text, what, which came to my mind though, was a series of studies done with uh, Lama Oser. Now this, if you want to find the text on this, there's actually a book called Destructive Emotions and it's written with you know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And, um, but the, the book talks about you know, scientists who visited with the Dalai Lama and did research and, and asked questions about emotions and, and how emotions can be just destructive and everything. But the point is, is there, there's, an, uh, there's a section in there that talks about the research that was done with um, a person they call Lama Oser. That's not, his, not the Lama's real name. Um, they use a pseudonym. But the, what they had this Lama do, they had him hold certain states of consciousness while he was having his brain imaged. And uh, then, it, you know, so the Lama talks about how being in the um, fMRI, you know, put him in a certain state and he was able to focus on a particular bolt while he was in there in order to hold his uh, steady gaze and that when he switched different types of meditation they were actually able to see on the brain imaging that there was a shift uh, neurologically in his physical brain. Um, so different states of consciousness were being equated with different uh, uh, physical brain structures. Um, there were all other studies that were also done which were on perception and uh, emotions, but I won't get into that. I just wanted to point out the, the, the piece where they were imaging his brain while he was uh, shifting his consciousness and in, in using different meditative techniques. The authors um, talking about uh, neurophenomenology really broke the tradition down into two separate areas. There were the cognitive neuropsychologists, or neurophenomenologists rather, um, like Varela, who, uh, ha who hold a particular orientation towards uh, cognitive neurophenomenology. And one of the quotes I appreciated here from Varela is that it's a process of external emergence with well-defined neurobiological attributes and description that stays close to our lived experience. That's how he describes cognitive neurophenomenology. And um, this tradition focuses on the embodiment of consciousness. Uh, well, actually, these are several areas that have been studied using this tradition. Embodiment of consciousness, uh, self-consciousness, hypnosis. Uh, often these folks are the philosophers and the psychologists. Uh, they often do experimental research, like I was just talking about with Lama Oser. Um, you have individuals who are using helmets, um, you know, EEG helmets that are uh, EEG nodes and electrodes on the brain while having people in certain meditative states or um, uh, remembering having certain spiritual adepts remember uh, experiences they've had while engaged in spiritual practices and looking at, at different um, patterns that change within the brain. Um, there's all sorts of research that's been coming out um, with this regard. 
The other tradition within neurophenomenology is called cultural neurophenomenology, and this is Laughlin's tradition. These are by and large anthropologists and transpersonal anthropologists included. Their experiments are more, well, actually non-experimental. The research is more non-experimental and it's more naturalistic, uh, going into different cultures, going into different um, places, and interviewing them in depth. Uh, the focus here within this tradition is on culture and cultural impacts on consciousness and conscious awareness. Um, how our cultural or social context influences our first-person lived experience. And um, so that uh, combined with the neurological overlay and, and kind of reading the, uh, how the neurological correlates map onto the um, awareness and, and different states of consciousness from around different cultures and how there might be differences between different cultures. Some research has been done in this area um, in particular are religious and spiritual practices. Uh, time consciousness, dreaming and dream culture, uh, experiences of healing, spontaneous healing or uh, induced healing from shamanic practices or, or different types of things. So, uh, very transpersonally oriented. So in summary, the phenomenological research method is a research method which focuses on collecting data from a very few participants, sometimes as little as one, um, you'll see eight, maybe even up to ten, but the, really the numbers here are very small because you have to get so much data from one person. Uh, so from a few participants in which they describe in detail their first-hand lived experience of a very particular experience, uh, often over a very short time frame. We're not talking about uh, long processes that, that happen over years. We want to have um, a study of something that's very time limited, very focused. The analysis can include interpretation or not, depending on which tradition you go into, but it always focuses on rich, thick descriptions of the experience. And that's, uh, that's a key. This is a descriptive process, uh, descriptive research method. Others try and look at how people change um, or you know the, the experimental method or even some qualitative methods they look at how people change due to a particular process or um, how people describe certain um, change processes. Well the description of change processes could fall under here but really um, this method is on description of an experience. So that's key. Those of you thinking about this method, um, you know, think about whether you really want to engage in that, that thick description just of an experience from a, that a few people have had. So this week's assignment. So in the Cresswell text, uh, there are sections that are posted online. There is a case at the end of that. Very great uh, case uh, that has to do with nurses. So please look at that case, read it, and analyze that case using the worksheet that I've posted online. Note, when you are uh, doing your analysis, please, please make sure to refer to the texts you have read this week when performing your analysis. And also, I think it goes for the discussion as well. When you're posting your discussion, refer to the texts. That's why we're here. It's not just about throwing opinion around. It's about uh, embedding um, and, and um, uh, processing what you're learning as you're engaging these texts. And that way we can have a um, level of discussion online that is focused on the text and really engaging that material. So for the discussion this week, please describe your understanding of the phenomenological research methods and how it is used. Secondarily, what topic might you use this method with? How would you structure the study and would you choose classic hermeneutic or neurophenomenological method? And finally, list several questions which came up for you while you were reading the texts. All right, well, I look forward to our discussion online and we'll see you soon.